Okay. And we're we're live. Anyone else who's not speaking, if you could just mute, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, you get not a problem. Okay, we'll give we'll give people just one more minute though. I mean, I think we're approaching the one o'clock. Um, so just bear with us, folks. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Majors. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development at DEED. I'm so glad to be here with you all today, this afternoon, a uh, beautiful day outside. It's also a really great day for DEED. Um, it was just announced probably about an hour or so ago that we actually have our new commissioner for DEED. As many of you may know, is that Steve Grove, uh, who had been our leader for um, four years, uh, moved on become become the um, the publisher at the Strip uh, back in April, and uh, the governor's office has identified an excellent candidate to come in and the lead uh, deed moving forward. Um, and his name is Matt Verilik, and he comes to us from central Minnesota and just has a great wealth of, of um, experience, both in the not-for-profit uh, foundational world and also worked um, in, in the Obama administration at the Small Business uh, Administration as COO. And he's also done some work on Capitol Hill and just has a great uh, breadth of experience in government and uh, the not-for-profit world. So we couldn't be more delighted to have uh, a great leader uh, coming on board. His first day will be on June June 20th, and I'm sure uh, you'll be hearing from him uh, sooner than later. Um, so and you have, if you get a chance uh, to ever meet him, congratulate him and get to know him. I just had a chance to meet with him um, briefly about an hour ago and just really a nice, nice uh, person. And I think he's going to be a great leader for Deed and for the state of Minnesota. Um, other great news that we have for Deed is, if many may know, is that um, we've signed our jobs omnibus bill. Um, and this is like historic money amount of money that is going into workforce development um, in the next two years and approximately about almost about a hundred million dollars um, going into workforce development and that is a lot of money um, but we have a great need as we have 185,000 vacancies in the state um, and we need to find those workers and get them trained up to meet the moment um, so um, this is what the part of this presentation is about so we'll just go ahead and get started and then what we'll do is we'll take questions at the end um okay so we'll start with the we'll go to the next slide please so um i did the introductions this will be a little bit of the agenda which we're looking at and we'll be looking at the competitive grants uh we'll talk about grant proposals 101 community reviewers technical assistance and then we'll have some time for q a next slide okay so um in the upcoming in this upcoming year um, and these are what I would call our signature grants. Um, so these are grants that are have been in our portfolio for at least um, two to two to eight years. Um, and so we wanted to kind of roll these out first as they will be the first set of RFPs that will be coming out in the next three to four um, weeks. So um, and you can see them there and we'll go to the next start, slide and get started. I'm going to be joined by my colleague Ann Myers, who actually oversees these brands, um, and she'll be adding um, a little bit additional information than I have um, on these specific areas. So, uh, um, so let's talk about P2P or Pathways to Prosperity, which is one of our signature adult career pathways uh, programs. It's a program that's been around for oh, probably about, I would say about eight years um, and has gone through multiple iterations over the last uh, eight years. And we've kind of finalized, I think we have a pretty good model this, um, this time or even last time when we rolled it out. And it came out in three phases. Um, first phase was, uh, and we heard, we listened to the public a lot about Pathways to Prosperity. And that's why we made some augmentation 
limitations to the program model. So the first thing we learned about, heard about was there's just a great need for working with individuals who have multiple barriers to employment, like just getting them ready just to enter a, a training program. Like there's some things that folks need to work on um, everywhere from working on their driver's license to maybe they're dealing with some other parts of their life, finding housing and so forth. But they also need some assistance with also like adult basic education and other educational components to kind of get them up to speed to be get ready for um, the next phase, which we say what we call uh, occupational skills training and more kind of CRT or classroom training. And I'll, I'll try to prevent doing uh, saying too many acronyms today. Um, and you know that's a that's a portion where the uh, for our phase two I would call it is where we have individuals who are um, who are ready to you know get skilled up and enter the workforce. And then our phase three of the of the P two P is around reskilling individuals who may be in in current who may currently be in um, entry level jobs. And so what we've looked at doing is to help those individuals kind of reskill. Is we've identified um, a program model which we use individual training accounts or IT as we call them, where we'll give individuals up to $7,000 to take and use it as kind of a voucher, if you will, and go to a provider that's on our ETPL list. Um, it's something that's kind of new. Um, we rolled it out last session, um, and we uh, think that there's going to be a lot of, we, we anticipate a lot more use of those ITAs moving forward. It creates a lot of freedom for those workers who uh, may not be able to go to traditional classroom training programs during the day or on week you know, and so that they can actually augment and use the actual um, ITA to go to a training that they feel like they need to help them move up in um, their economic situation. And do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I certainly can. Um, so I think one of the things that makes the Pathways to Prosperity program unique is that we do emphasize the uh, importance of a navigator or a point person that's available for participants. So we all know participants run into crises um, quite often and things happen while they're going through training, but having that point person or that navigator with them throughout their entire time in a training program is really important. And so um, I think what is the thing that that goes through all three parts of the P2P program is that navigation support or that one contact uh, point person for participants. So. Sam, um, so um, next slide, please. So, ah, uh, great. This is an awesome program as well, which is our Southeast Asian Economic Relief Competitive Grants Program. And this grant obviously is a setup to assist individuals who come from the Southeast Asian community and others um, to prepare to do some work readiness, essentially. Um, it, it was a program that came in, like I said, about two, probably two terms ago, um, and has been heavily accessed by multiple um, programs and also individuals throughout the state. So this is another one of those programs where where, um, you know, individuals get assistance with like job creation, case management, supportive services, and all the things that are going to prepare them to enter the workforce. So I'm um, super excited about this move forward. And I'm not sure if you want to add anything. Yeah, just real quick, sorry. Um, the So anybody, uh, organizations can apply to receive the funding for this program. They don't have to be a Southeast Asian led organization. It's just that they have to serve up Southeast Asian uh, community members with these these funds. The other thing that's unique with this is um, it offers funding to larger organizations to help um, build the capacity of smaller organizations. Um, and so that's another piece of this uh, uh, program that makes it unique. Thanks, Dan. And we'll go to the next slide. Board of Services competitive grants. And so one thing we know is that individuals, when, when individuals are going through training, a lot of times they need supportive services um, to help them with paying for like books, boots, 
tools, whatever it, it may need, they may need, and so that they can be successful as they're going through their training. You know, one of our goals is to help people as much as they can so they can focus on, uh, the, you know, their training and so they can get to work. And so having this assistance to help individuals with a very a variety of tools and services is really important to us. So for the adult population, um, we will be rolling out that grant um, again, again in probably the next 30 to 45 days. Um, but the youth for the youth population, those actually those RFPs went out back in February and March. And so um, and, the, and we're in the right process of making the determination on those as we um, as we speak, actually. Um, one of the things that's really cool about this rural program is that a provider does not that is seeking funding does not have to be um, a recipient of deep funds right now. So if you're so, for example, if you're an organization that's providing some type of training, um, however, you don't have funding to provide those supportive services um, to the individuals you're training, you could actually apply for this grant and if awarded, provide, you know, those support services to those individuals in your training. So um, super continue to be super excited, super uh, about this grant uh, program. It's obviously extremely um, important one for a lot of individuals who are trying to get into the workforce through training programs or reskill up through training programs. So um, and anything you want to add on to that? No, but you, I think you covered it. Thanks. Thanks. OK, we'll go to the next one. So Women Economic Security Act, um, and this is a program that's really geared to helping women move into those non-traditional jobs, as you can see at the bottom here, like STEM um, and also like heavy uh, like construction and other types of non-traditional employment for um, women. Um, and it's a great program because I think it's one of the one of our strongest in terms of placements. Our placement rates um, for folks are employed at an average wage of about twenty four thousand dollars. I'm sorry, twenty four dollars an hour. Um, and um, and it just is incredible. Actually, earlier today we just heard about a, a young woman who was in one of these programs, one of the WISA programs, and we went into heavy truck driving and um, actually. Um, took in six weeks, learned everywhere from how does a truck uh, operate to gain on the road and driving. She can be more thrilled to be um, out there on the road. So um, there's some great um, stories that come out from the work that happens and the training that comes out of these programs. And we're just so delighted to continue this on. I think this is probably about six or eight years as well that's been in our portfolio. And you wanna add anything? Yeah, the WISA program is an exciting program um, for my team. And so I think one of the things that we added last go around is that IT training is uh, can be one of these uh, high wage, high demand, non-traditional occupations for women. So that was really exciting, something that we added last go around. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we'll go on to the next uh, slide, please. Ah, uh, yes, the African Immigrant Workforce Grants. So um, like the Southeast Asian uh, Workforce Grants, about two years ago, or last year, we actually added the African Immigrant Workforce Grant. And it's similar in the, in the same terms, the same scope as the Southeast Asian. It's really kind of geared to working with the African, with African immigrants and helping them with job readiness, work readiness, um, addressing all those issues that may be um, a barrier for them to um, obviously participate in training, but also help them get into the workforce. So this is another exciting grant that, um, that we have on deck to work with the African immigrant population. Um, so you'll see that coming out soon too. And then we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so those are the programs. Before I jump into the Grants Proposal 101, as I mentioned earlier, we are in, we received a record amount of funding for workforce development this year, um, thanks to the governor and the lieutenant governor for bringing very uh, aggressive and but much needed uh, workforce proposals to the legislature. And thank you to a big shout out to um, Senator Champion and Representative Zong for being um, mindful, thoughtful and great leaders and shepherding a really robust uh, jobs bill forward. Um, and so some of the things that we're adding to our portfolio and I'll go through them real quickly um, are we identified um, what one is called the drive for five 
And that what that is, is that we've identified using labor market information of the most high growth with the family sustainable wage um, sectors um, in the state. And those are manufacturing, caring professionals, education, construction, and technology. And so where we're with this drive for five is we're making a hefty investment, almost $20 million into prepping people to go into those high growth industries. Now, let me be clear here. That doesn't mean other industries are not important to us. And actually, I think those other industries may work, you know, nicely if you start looking at the pathways to prosperity grants um, that we did, we started this all off with. So child care is important to us, hospitality is important to us, transportation is important to us as well. Um, but we just identified these uh, five um, uh, industries because they had, again, high growth and also family sustainable wage at about $50,000 on average. Um, other grants that we'll be seeing in the fall, probably the RFPs will be targeted populations. And so what we wanted to do was make an investment into those smaller community-based organizations that are closer or very close to the ground, but they may not have the funding um, or quite frankly, a lot of the experience as one of some of our larger partners. And so we want to invest in those organizations to assist them with um, the delivering services, um, the services that they want to deliver um, to the community. So you'll see more around the targeted populations as well. Third is that we doubled down on our youth portfolio. So we have excellent youth, existing youth programs, um, which are contained of the Minnesota Youth Program, uh, Youth at Work, and our also Youth Build programs. So in the past, we've actually trained roughly about 19,000 individuals, um, young people um, in, in youth uh, services. This we're doubling down. So we anticipate that we're gonna actually train almost 38,000 youth across Minnesota uh, and get them work ready so that they can enter um, a lot of these 185,000 vacancies that we have to be quite frank. And then the third, the last one, um, which I'm just completely excited about is the new office of new Americans. Um, this is a office that um, it's kind of been developing over the last three years. Um, and it's finally this year got across the finish line. And so this is an office that will be working with a lot of our immigrant and our refugee populations um, to talk about, you know, issues everywhere from um, how to access deeds workforce programs to deeds also economic development programs but they also will be focused on translation services for a lot of our programs as well and that office is going to be led by assistant commissioner muhammad so we have a lot of great uh, initiatives that are coming rolling out in addition there's a couple two more that are coming out with us um this is um as a lot of you know that the cannabis um, has been legalized in minnesota and so we'll be having a training program we're looking for training providers to deliver cannabis training and then additionally, as a lot of you have heard about, is like clean clean energy field is a growing industry in, uh, industry for us here at the and around the state actually. So we will be putting out an RFP around clean energy as well. Um, those programs will be rolling out in the fall um, as we get closer, and we want to get through this first phase um, that we started with, and then we'll go through a phase two. What you can expect is you'll see me and my other colleagues will be out around the state throughout the course of July and maybe August talking about these uh, opportunities coming up in the future. But I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up so you know that they're they're rolling out in case you've read the legislation and you're kind of wondering what those are. So um, that's just a little bit of a side note. So let's talk about grants proposals. Uh, 101. So we are really excited to be entering into a contract with the Minnesota Council of Not-for-Profits um, to deliver grant proposals 101. One of the things that we've heard uh, over the last uh, couple of years as we've done our community engagement is it's hard to write a proposal on deeds. Proposals are kind of hard to understand and read. And, and if we've, we've never done them before, how do we get engaged? And so hearing and understanding that information, we are going to deliver a four, um, four session um, grant proposals 101. There will be one hour segments each and they will be videotaped. Um, you know, first will be in program design and services. So like how do you write your RFP and talk about your program design and services. Um, and then we'll talk about there will be a session on fiscal requirements and then ultimately there will be one on monitoring requirements and then as well as the program performance. But we wanted to make sure we wanted to roll this out. This will be hopefully we rolled out by in the middle of June uh, sometime so that folks can access it. It will be delivered in four languages, English, uh, Somali, Spanish, and Hmong. 
Um, those are to start. I mean, I think we'll look at, you know, in the future, looking at expanding it, but that would be the initial uh, rollout. Um, again, they'll be videotaped and we will let you all know um, as, as you signed up, since you're on our list now, um, we'll let you know when those are going to roll out and we look forward to you participating and as well as they will be free. Um, so there'll be no cost to anyone who participates and, and access these, um, um, this, these uh, segments. Next slide, please. So community reviewers. So um, many of you may know in the past we have used community reviewers in our process, um, in our RFP process. And the reason why is community folks have a better understanding than a lot of times those of us like myself um, who may not be close to the community and under they understand the program models a lot better and have a different voice and viewpoint about what the services are and the necessity of services. And, and it really brings just an incredible important voice to the process. So probably starting back almost, I guess, maybe six years ago under data administration, they did start using the community reviewer process. In the last four years under Governor Walls and Lieutenant and Governor Flanagan, we've really have bumped that up and really have done a great deal of, and, and all the workforce development programs, uh, competitive grants processes, we include community voices in that process. We have what we call an OKR, uh, Objective and Key Results, where we, we as a state agency said, at least 25% of the folks that are participating on our review process have to be community reviewers. And thanks to Ann and others um, in our adult career pathways and has really engaged the community reviewers and so much that I think in our last round, of, our last round of uh, uh, RFPs, I think we had almost about 50% of the, the panels were community reviewers. So this is a super critical um, piece of the RFP process and we need all of you to help us with identifying folks. Um, as I just told you, $100 million in competitive grants. We need more community reviewers than we can begin to tell you about and I think it's so critical to have the again those that voice at the table so um, you will be you will see receive and we'll also post it somewhere a, a notification about opportunities for folks to participate in the community review opportunities so please share that as much as you possibly can and we look forward to getting um, a lot of folks to participate thank you next slide and then this is the most important piece here if you have any questions about anything that I said today, you get to call Ann. Um, Ann, is, Ann is our supervisor for our ACP um, grants and actually is a super expert, very knowledgeable and just, you know, uh, also just a great leader at DEED and in the community and also comes from the not-for-profit world. Um, so she just brings a wealth of experience and knowledge and compassion um, and just uh, it can be a, a true good place to start with if you have questions kind of moving forward. So with that, and I'm not sure if you want to add anything. No, th thanks. Great information. Um, yep, reach out to me if you have any questions. I've, I've already gotten some uh, really great questions via email, so keep them coming. So we'll take a we'll take a few minutes. Uh, you no, know, you know we blocked off for half an hour, but um, but we, we could take some time to answer some uh, questions if you have them. And you can raise your hand or put them in the chat. Whatever works for you. Deputy Commissioners, already four questions. Maybe I can get you started. Um, my computer is being a little slow, but we're, we're moving here. The first question is um, by Allie, I'm guessing. Our company was denied P2P grant for 2023 first round. Would, would we be able to supplement with support service grant and how would we apply? So if I understand the question correctly, is agency applied for the grant and they were not, they didn't receive it. However, they had funding to continue on with the grant um, and they want to know if they're eligible for um, supportive service to apply for the supportive services. Correct. Okay. And, and you want to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we encourage anyone who feels like they would meet the requirements or the qualifications for any one of our requests for proposals to apply. 
Um, this, the adult support services is focused on supporting an existing workforce development program in the adult side. So if you have an existing program, in a, like Mark mentioned, it doesn't have to be deed funded. Um, I certainly encourage you to apply uh, when the RFPs are released. Thank you, Anne and Deputy Commissioner. The next question is where can where can you find a list of grantee for these great programs? Um, I'm assuming you mean existing grantees. Um, and so you could find those actually on our website. Um, and we can we can post or send that uh, link out to uh, folks um, afterwards with the um, this presentation and we could provide that to you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Commissioner. The next question is what is the time frame for these opportunity by Martin? Yeah, actually, uh, Ann and I were just talking about this prior to the to this meeting. Um, we we're working on a, a proposed schedule, and the idea is that we want to kind of as much as we possibly can stagger these out. Last last year alone, when we got last time for last uh, biennial, we had almost twelve RFPs we had to roll out, and it was just and I think you know, uh, which is which was a lot. It was a lot for us, and it was a lot for you all too. And so we try to be very thoughtful about how we roll these out and to give folks enough time to apply. And so you'll probably see this in a couple of phases. And the first phase will be this first slot that I we just went through with the Pathways to Prosperity. We set out these agents. So you can expect to see those probably within the next 30 days. Um, start to roll out and we'll give you about 45 days um, to respond. What I really do encourage you to do is to start, if you're really interested in these, start thinking about now. Don't wait till um, don't wait till you know they actually are rolled out. Um, they're pretty straightforward. I think our old RFPs may be still online. Um, and if you want to see an old RFP, the, we can always send them to you um, if you request them, just so you can get a sense of what the RFPs look like. Um, and no, but there's no there's no secret about uh, what they are. It, they fall in line with what we've done in the past. Um, and the reason why we do this so quickly is because. We, have, we, have, we are in a little bit of conundrum, essentially. It's like we can roll them out really slow, but that just means the money gets out to the community a lot slower. And I think a lot of folks don't want that. And I think, um, you know, you all's organizations want to get the money out, uh, get the money out to you all um, so that you can begin to work um, as soon as possible, the critical work and important work um, as soon as possible. So it's a little bit of a crunch, but we try to be thoughtful about how we're rolling them out. So you can expect, like I said, in the next 30 days, the first wave will come out. And then those other grant opportunities like the Drive for Five and Targeted Populations, we'll look to probably roll those out in late summer um, or the beginning of the fall. Thank you. I think this question is regarding to P2P. Will each of the two P P2P grants be offered as two or one year grants again? So we're in the middle of actually trying to work that out. Um, I know that's been a big question for a lot of folks and as well as the team has advocated um, a great deal that we're listening to you and we're trying to figure out the mechanics internally, how, how that can work to ensure sure there's no hiccups with that. So uh, we will come back to you all um, with that and once, particularly when we're ready to roll the RFPs out, I hope to have that determined by before we roll the RFPs out. Um, so people are very aware of what they're getting themselves into, but we understand the challenges of it um, and appreciate it. We want to be, you know, want to make sure that we can do it in a thoughtful and smart way too. Um, and then what that means is that making sure there's mechanisms internally that if if we do move in that way, like there won't be, um, you know, delays in payments and, and things like that. And so more to come on that. Great question. Thank you. The next question is from Beth. Can individuals who are submitting a response to an RFP for one program, let's say P2P, be a community reviewer for a program they aren't applying for, like WISA or other? And you're shaking your head, so. Yeah, yes, you can. They, um, as long as you don't have a conflict of interest and all community reviewers go through a short training and they all sign conflict of interest forms to make sure that um, they're not an applicant for the same program you're reviewing. So, yep. Thank you, Ann. Um, looks like this individual jump a little bit later, but it sounds like we got a new deed commissioner. Could you repeat who it was? 
for this individual? Sure. Um, his name is Matt Verilik, and he comes to us from central Minnesota. Um, once again, Matt's experience is both as, uh, in a foundation world as well as on the federal government. He worked, he was the COO of the SBA uh, under the Obama administration. He's also worked with uh, Congressman Dasho, and I believe he's even dabbled a little bit in politics himself um, in, a, in, a, in his previous life. Um, a ton of experience, has been a great partner with Deed, um, has a very, my understanding is a collaborative um, spirit about working with folks and reaches into multiple communities across the state of Minnesota. So um, we're, we're just really delighted to have a commissioner on board and someone with his experience, especially with just a, you know, vast array everywhere from policy to actually foundations to the federal government, which is covers everything that we do here at DEEP. So super excited um, and I'm sure um, you'll get to know him uh, more as we get as he gets started on June 20th. Thank you. There's a few questions here about the new programs that you had listed that came from this legislative session. Um, one, could you review what the drive for five areas were? And then we can jump on afterwards on the next following questions. Sure. So again, these are these are brand new and we're just trying to be responsive uh, to the needs of our employers. Um, and as like, for instance, you know, healthcare, where we're calling caring professionals, we have over 60,000 vacancies in the caring professional field alone here in Minnesota. We need to get a workforce. I mean, it's imperative that we start preparing folks to fill those jobs. I mean, obviously our, our state's health is at, at risk every time we lose folks out of our healthcare uh, uh, facilities or, uh, or businesses. So. Um, the five are, and I'll go over them one more time, are caring professionals, or otherwise known as healthcare for a lot of folks. Um, it's manufacturing, technology, construction, and education. And again, these are these have been identified by our, our labor market information team as these high growth with family average family sustainable wage at about fifty thousand dollars. Thanks. And then following that, could you just list the program that we're getting? Um, just maybe list the title of the programs that we just received recently. Sure, um, not a problem. Um, really excited. Um, again, drive for five, targeted populations, um, youth, and then the last one we just talked about was the Office of New Americans. So that those are the big. Oh, and I'm sorry. And then there's uh, there's it's under it's called can train, but it's I'm just calling it cannabis train uh, training. And then there's one on clean energy um, training as well that will be ro rolling out. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about capacity building grants? Are there going to be grants to agency to build overall capacity in the workforce services? Yeah, so there's two uh, grants that are out there. So as a lot of you may know, Propel actually um, usually re receives uh, capacity building grants. I believe they got a significant amount of uh, money in their allocation for capacity building. I forget the dollar amount, but it's pretty hefty if I remember correctly. Um, in addition, as under our targeted populations grant, we also carved out some money for um, capacity building. And we realized there's a lot of things that, spark, particularly for our newer organizations, they need help, right? They need help from everywhere from, you know, building up their infrastructure to, you know, to assistance with putting together their, their fiscal um, requirements and uh, documents and systems. Um, they may even need assistance with actually, quite frankly, doing using Workforce One. Um, and so um, we are really excited to have this allocation to help our community-based organizations because we want you all to be successful, um, but we need to help you out with providing, you know, some resources, additional resources, so that you can meet the moment and really serve the folks that um, you work so hard to deliver services to. Thank you. The next question comes from Todd. Um, he's wondering if there are any program focused on training telecom construction broadband deployment technicians. Um, this could be a great opportunity for getting women involved in this traditional male profession. Yeah, well, we look to you all to actually tell us that, what you want to do the training in, 
you know, and you should be using our labor market information to help you as you submit your applications for the RFP. We will also be providing that um, a direct link to our um, our LMI um, information. We have we do a really good job here in Minnesota with our LMI data. Um, it's actually nationally recognized the work that gets done. So we encourage you to use that. Well, it's almost actually kind of you need to when you submit your RFP because you have to support why you're going into this area. Um, additionally, I think where I think this is really kind of going to is that we are working with our partners over at Commerce um, as well as MnDOT to understand what their hiring needs are around construction. Um, and internally, we're working on those um, on, uh, workforce development plans, um, the broadband and the digital um, inclusion. I'm not sure where that all lies in terms of future RFPs at this point in time. So um, I won't, you know, I can't say wait for that, but I, what I will say is if that's something that you're interested in, you should be looking at the grant opportunities where that can lie. So if it's like, if it's WISA, you should submit an RFP for that. Um, we encourage that. I mean, those are occupations that are not traditional particularly, um, but you can also look at P2P as well. Thank you, Dr. I'm sure um, someone is asking about if there was an announcement about getting to work. Um, not yet. We are still, quite frankly, we are still going through this budget, um, this, this legislation. And so once we get, uh, we're glad though, we're glad it's back in the um, inside of our, uh, the legislative package, um, but we will be rolling that out as well. Um, it's just, you know, we have, they get $100 million worth of program programs. Um, we probably have about 90 dis, uh, direct appropriations and we're the team, you know, um, is uh, working all through that, but we will get that our RFP out as well. Thank you. The next question is, when will the next round of requests for proposal for P2P and support service grant be available? Yeah, again, they'll go out uh, probably in the next uh, 30 to 45 days. Thank you. Is support services just for youth? No, the, there is. A, we get we get a set amount of a set allocation, and we actually divide it between the youth and the adult uh, career pathways program. So the youth has already allocation RFP has actually already gone out, and it's actually in the process of make we're making our determinations on those allocations, um, and to who those awardees will be. You'll see for the adult. Um, support services. Again, that will be coming out probably in the next 30 to 45 days. Okay, so if the, the RFP are coming out in 30 days, 45 days, when would the potential start date be for these grants if the grantees were selected? Well, we'll, well, we're working on that because again, we're staggering this. So um, we need to kind of like look at the full kind of what that rollout looks like. Um, but you could expect it would be, you know, where we leave as a goal um, is that most of our grants, particularly these these five or four, uh, five, um, will be in con full contract before December, um, by December. Um, so no later than December, we anticipate for that to get uh, get started. Thank you. This isn't a question, more of a comment. There have been a lot of conversation among workforce works about encouraging D to move to effective dates versus dates of execution to avoid gaps in funding. Many forks have to go unfunded for a few months with existing staff due to deep capacity. Can you comment on that or say a little bit more, Deputy Commissioner? So I would love to, to have that conversation off on the side since we're kind of talking more around the RFPs process. Um, and I know it's somewhat, somewhat related, but this very, it sounds like it's very directed uh, about the local workforce development board. So I'll be glad that um, if we have, do we, do we know who submitted that? We got There isn't a name, but if they're, they can just leave their email address, we'll contact them. Yeah. Separately. Good question though. Thank you. Let me just go back and see. Are you able to apply for more than one grant at a time? Absolutely, you know, and that's why we're going to stagger these these grants, uh, these RFPs out rather, because we know folks want to apply for more than one. Um, if we we you know we could have just like say we're going to push it, put out you know 
10 RFPs all at one time. But and we know that's that's not fair. It's not fair to my my team at Deed, but it's also not fair to the grantees. And we we do encourage organizations to look at all the grant opportunities and to be thoughtful about what they are submitting RFPs for. And, it, and like I said, there's a there's a lot of programs here. Um, and obviously, you know, there you know capacity is an issue for a lot of organizations. So the one of the reasons why we're staggering them out again is so that um, if an organization wants to apply for more than one, they have enough time to to do so. Thank you for that. Let me just make sure I'm not missing folks here. Bear with me, they're just slowly coming in on my no end here. Uh, would you discourage P2P applicants that feature training supports supporting the drive for five industry? Our community has great benefited from P2P healthcare and construction training. Yeah, I mean, I think we're not discouraging anyone from doing anything. Um, you could apply for whatever you want to apply for. We do recommend, though, if you have a grant um, that's in those one of those five industries that you, you know, look at the drive for five as an alternative because it creates more opportunity for other individual or other organizations for P2P. Um, you may not know this, but I mean, we get an, um, almost I would say maybe about five to you know the ten million dollar more request for P2P than we have for budgeting. So we would suggest that you should look at that now. Now, um, no, but no. Hey, if you're looking at P2P on, I'll say this, like on the barrier removal piece of it or the ITA piece of it, then I think you should be looking at P2P. Um, you know, because we probably will not go with those that kind of model for the drive for five. Um, we'll be looking for kind of a little bit of, you know, basic um, while we're still formulating the model, but we probably won't do a barrier removal kind of component of that. That's really what we want to use for P2P. We'll be looking for skills training, um, occupational skills training, uh, work experience, OJTs, things like that, um, and reskilling of individuals for that um, drive for five. So I think that, you know, when we get to what will happen is when we start to roll out the RFPs and we'll also be having webinars to kind of walk you through what those opportunities look like and where what the model is. And we'll have a better sense um, of what we're thinking about for the drive for five um, versus P2P. These are great questions. I know there's a lot of confusion around it, um, but so that you will be able to make that determination before um, uh, your, you need to submit your um, applications or, or, pro or proposals. Thank you. The next question is, will there be required partnership in the P2P models between CBO and adult education provider? I'll turn that one over to Ann. Yes, yeah, so we did not change the model or we don't anticipate changing the model of the P2Ps from the SFY 2223s. So um, the components in there um, from last go around, we anticipate the same this go around, and that's one of the components. Thank you, Anne, for that. Uh, the next question, the application for use at work have already been submitted. We base our request on the prior amount. Will there be additional use proposal coming? If so, when? Yeah, so the RFP has been has been out and actually, you know, I think the team is going back based on the additional dollars and looking at what the if the um what the allocations are proposed allocations are going to look like. Um generally again, like this program, this is why this funding is just incredible to have is that um we oftentimes get between 5 to 10 million dollars more requests than we have um, funding available. So I'm sure the team will, as they're kind of looking at the additional funding coming down the road um, for the um, youth at work and support uh, youth at work in the um, youth build um, pro uh, programs, I think they'll be able to kind of go further down the list than they have in the past. So I don't anticipate a reissuance of the um, of the RFP at this point in time. Thank you. I know you talked a little bit about the timeline on 30 to 45 days for the proposal. Do you expect to stagger the proposal or will they all come at once? 
So we'll stagger them out. Um, I can remember, like, as I may have mentioned earlier, Ann and I just uh, had a quick conversation earlier uh, prior to this meeting, and um, the team is going to present to me some ideas of what that will look like. It'll probably mirror a lot of what happened two years ago, where we kind of, you know, put P2P out and along with like WISA um, or something like that, where it wasn't a complete overlap, um, because we know sometimes organizations want to apply for for more than one. Um, so we try to be thoughtful about it. So um, it will be staggered um, and we'll let you know as soon as possible when those what those dates look like. Thank you. And then will you announce P2P grantees before drive for five applications are due? Probably not, um, just the way they're going to be rolling out. And I know where I know where that question is kind of going towards. Um, and the the difficulty with that is just kind of the timing. We want to get we want to get the RFPs out as close as possible. Um, we may have a better sense by time, depending on when that we roll them out. We may have a better sense of where people land. Um, so I won't say it won't happen, um, but I'll say probably will not happen um, about the P2P um, announcements before the a drive for five um, occur. And again, I would say as you're looking at um the the p2p model the things that you want to kind of focus on are are you delivering the basic skills or are very removable services and or are you delivering the itas and if you are then the p2p models probably for you if you're going to look at like looking at occupational skills training a drive for five probably be um, the more appropriate model for you in those areas in those areas those high growth areas Excellent. I don't see any more new questions. The last um, item, it looks like someone was able to put in a, a link to the telecom training on Korea Force training website. So um, you should be able to access that link, but we could always put that on our follow up items when we send everything out. Um, we'll just give a few more minutes. Um, for Q and A, but those were all the questions that I used to ask them to come through as of now. And well, I think folks can unmute themselves. So if you have a question, you should be able to unmute and ask as well. I hear none, Deputy Commissioner. So I'll turn it back to you to close us out. Thanks if there again. Aren't any more questions? Thanks again. Awesome as usual. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Anne, as well. Hey, folks, I really appreciate the time uh, you sharing your time with us, um, learning about the programs. Again, we'll roll these out. We will give you full notice when they're going to come out, um, and we'll make sure do a blast on them. We'll also let you know about when the grant proposals 101 are going to occur. And understand this. When we roll these out, there still will be webinars, and our webinars are going to change up a little bit than we've done in the past. We're going to have an opportunity where you can ask questions right as they're delivering the webinar, um, so you'll be able to ask some questions then um, as well. Um, I, heard, I thoroughly encourage all of you um, who are thinking about grants to work with your local workforce development area and their boards. Um, there's are folks who have just a ton of knowledge and experience and really can be an asset to you. We also encourage partnerships, um, thinking about you know, how can you partner with um, folks as we're trying to really kind of do our outreach. We have to look into those communities that have traditionally been overlooked in the hiring process and really kind of engage those communities. So there's a great deal different type of outreach that's been done in the past, um, maybe some training that's going to be a little bit different. You maybe need some language um, tra language translation and some just other skills development that you may not have to may have had to do in the past. So I encourage uh, the partnerships with your partners and again the local workforce development areas um, around these grants. Um, we cannot be more excited uh, about this these opportunities. And I also encourage you to look at those occupations that have been you know take a look at the LMI data and look at those occupations where they are um, there's family sustainable wage jobs. That's where we want to move folks and also take in consideration. Hey, our economy is changing, right? Amazon is now moving towards computers for the folks that were kind of using floor workers. And so maybe now we need to start looking at different occupations like, you know, 
service folks for those uh, those um, robots. We know that, for instance, we know the chips industry, um, that there's going to be a need of workers to help us develop those, uh, do that chips manufacturing. Um, you know, and there's just a whole host of other type of occupations that come down, cybersecurity. Um, so I would say, as my boss used to tell me, is look around the corner for where those, those high wage jobs are going to be and find a way to create a pathway for individuals kind of moving in that direction. I want to thank you all for your time. I also want to thank you for the work that you do. You do the work on the ground, and which I always say, and I've said this publicly, and so my team's heard this, and I've said it multiple times, you all do a lot of heavy lifting. And you see you look people in their eye every day and work with them. And so your work is very much appreciated. And I just want to say that to you directly if you haven't heard that from me. I look forward to working with you. This is going to be posted up so you know you can offer it up to other folks. And if you have questions, feel free to you can call Ann, but you can also or email Ann, but you can also email me as well. So thank you for your time. Have a great rest of your day and enjoy your Memorial Day, folks. Take care.